Colossians 2. For I would that ye knew what great conflict I have for you, and for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God, and of the Father, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received a Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And welcome back, dear brothers and sisters, to God is Walking on Water channel. Okay, um, I'm so. on, tw I'm on Twitter as um, Saint Paul at Antioch. Paul, Paul, in, wait, Paul in Antioch is my Twitter. And so, I like Saint Paul a lot because a lot of the arguments um, people make on Twitter, they'll say, "Yeah, Jesus didn't say that. Paul said that." And so. I just started um, embracing the fact that Paul is teaching what Jesus is teaching. And so that's basically the intro to my name right there. And Antioch was a pivotal point in the Bible where um, St. Paul was a Pharisee and he was Jewish. And he's teaching um, the Jews and Peter in Antioch that they are being Judaizers. And so... Um, we are supposed to preach the word of the gospel to everybody, including Gentiles and Jews. And so that's what um, the Church of Antioch basically established, was that um, we don't need a, the Vatican too. What we need is to teach Jewish people about the Messiah, and we need to teach Gentile people about the Messiah. And that's my name. Amen. Amen. I, I managed to sort out the issue. It was my bad. I was on a different outlet but it was going through, the audio was going through. So I'll just have to edit that part out. <laughs> so um, my bad. So it's it's a pleasure to, to have you, uh, Brother Paul. And uh, we've been just discussing um, back and forth, and it was so... Uh -oh. ...story of how you came to Jesus Christ, the one true God, yep. and uh, how God has just unraveled all of this knowledge to you you've just received this download you you grew up catholic and how you came out of that and you got the real um knowledge of early church history i really appreciate that brother that you've been uh, educated and a lot of christians are not educated concerning the early church history um i'm sure all of you are familiar with paul's words in acts 20 verse 28 to 30 it's such an important verse brother paul because paul tells us that grievous wolves grievous wolves will enter the flock and yeah. not spare and i really believe that statement was warning about what would unfold in the third century with what happened at the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. I really believe Paul was warning about this great, great apostasy. Now, when I say great apostasy, uh, we know Jesus was already warning the disciples uh, that we were, they were already living in the end times. It was they were already in that period. So when Paul uses this language of uh, grievous wolves will enter the flock and not spare, he was already alluding to Second Thessalonians chapter two. I really believe that that he was okay. alluding to this great apostasy, and we're living in the final stages of this great apostasy. So I really believe the falling away 
occurred already in 325 AD when a lot of the bishops, the Monarchian bishops, compromised and they started uh, allying themselves with the Logos Christology camp. And we see this. Adolf Harnack clearly is a thorough and a objective historian that really shows all of uh, this evidence that ha has been suppressed by Trinitarians. And I'm going to be sharing some quotes from people like Thomas Tomkinson, uh, a 17th century apologist, mo mon monarchian apologist, where he literally says that the Catholics, and when I say Catholics, don't take it the wrong way, people that are in the Catholic camp, I'm talking about the institution, I'm talking about the system. And I really want people not to misunderstand my words. I'm not attacking the people, I'm attacking the system. That's what Jesus did with the Pharisees. Please, uh, br uh, um, brother, um, would you like to add something before I just... Uh, oh, quote? Yes, um, my thing froze again. Yeah, um, Isaac Newton, he basically said a similar thing. He said um, the the biggest heresy was not Romanism, but it was Trinitarianism. And so he and he basically nailed that on the head right there was um, I me. I do think it is a little bit Romanism with uh, the Pontifex Pontifex Maximus is a title that they used under the uh, Roman ancient um, pagan uh, religion. And so now the Catholic Church also called Pontifex, which is just a little coincidence. And they've built on Mithraic temples and you're not supposed to build on um, false pagan foundations like that. And so. There's many things like anti-popes. You could say that the Pope, uh, the Catholic Pope um, Caliustus Cali and Pope Zephyrinius were both agreeing with us in the early church about the oneness doctrine. Definitely, definitely. Uh, this and Callistus um, were actually bishops. Um, I think it was a Callistus and Zephyrinus that were both bishops. And um, what's interesting is to, um, Hypolitus uh, mentions um, Zephyrinus and Callistus as, you know, uh, being deceived when actually it's the, the, the opposite. Um, as Tertullian uh, states in uh, Tertullian against Praxius, Adversus Praxius, I have a personal copy, brother, and I know that you've read them, this, um, this work as well. A uh, very interesting quote where he says that uh, already in his day, uh, the simple people, which were the majority, the simple Christians, the faithful, he calls them the simple. He says that they were the majority. And get this, this is the key word he uses. He says, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, when they um, uh, think of the plurality of gods, they shun away from this notion and they hold to the monarchy and these logos um, theologians when they brought this idea that the son was added to the godhead the response of these uh, simple christians that who who were constituted of the majority they would respond by saying we hold to the monarchia and monarchia is the greek word for uh, we hold to the ruling, as a ruler, the ruling of one, which basically means we hold to one ruler, one individual. Very simple reply. And um, it just shows you that the Shema was heavily embedded in the early Christian church. No talk of Trinity, uh, all of that. So would you would you like to um, bridge with what I was sharing, brother? Yes. Um, I think that the Shema, um, also James White has, has just recently talked about this. The Shema is a um, pivotal Jewish prayer. Um, it's, it's the main focus. Hear, O Israel, our Lord is one. And then, so this Amen. is Old Testament. This is Jewish. Then you have Paul, the Pharisee, who is also Jewish and, and one of the best teachers of Christianity outside of Jesus and, and St. John. Mm. You have, um, oh, I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> you have, um, 
Happens. So you have the Shema. You have the Shema of the Old Testament, of the Jews. It's the most important. You can't deny that, that this is important, the Shema. Jews Hero, Israel, Israel our Lord is one God. Then you have Paul, Amen. who is a Pharisee, who a lot of Old Testament Jews reject him as being a false teacher. He's teaching the Shema in the New Testament. He's saying directed to Jesus, though, is the one Lord. And so it can't be two. It has to be that Jesus is the one Lord. And the Father is the one Lord. How could that be? They have to be one substance. Amen. I, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, even in Ephesians 4, and I forget which verse, it says, you know, one Lord, uh, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father who is above all and in you all and through you all. And he literally identifies this person with Jesus because we know in Zechariah uh, chapter 14, verse 9, it says on that day there will be one Lord that, and his name will be one and he will be king over the whole earth. That's very, very clear. And I don't know how it just it just beats me, I, I think, when when it try to uh, unravel this paganistic thought. Uh, which is the the Trinity doctrine? How they can take the single, uh, the singularity, the the oneness of these passages, and just transform it into a multiplicity, into a free uh, a Trinity, and uh, that these these passages are using are literally using personal singular pronouns, possessive singular pronouns. And I mean, we've all gone to school and we understand that such pronouns never, never uh, indicate a notion of plurality. Now, we can get into philosophy and that's what they use most of the time. They use philosophy. They use these straw man arguments to take words and kind of um, allegorize uh, these terms that are you can't violate such terms. There is poetic language in the scriptures. Granted, there is a he the Hebrew language is uh, a, f a figurative uh, language depending <coughs> on the usage of words and context. But when you have specific um, uh, uh, passages talking about God, it's never talking about a plurality. It's talking about a person and that person you can literally have develop a, a personal relationship with. This is why God is called Father. This is why God is called King. This is why God is called um, the husband of Israel. So all of these terms have meaning. And to take that and transform that in a pr plurality, that would be spiritual adultery. What, what, what do you think, Brother uh, Paul? I I think this this debate, it comes down to the word each ad, right? And so the word each ad by the Unitarians have always said, oh, it, it means singular, but it means singular denying that Christ is divine. So the Messianic Jewish camp split into two camps, one Unitarian, one Trinitarian. They're both wrong. And so the Trinitarian camp also wrong because they say it's a compound unity. And so just because a compound unity in singular can be the same word each ad used in different places, in a different way. It means that the Trinity, the so-called Trinity, the Holy Spirit, Father, Jesus, that's a compound unity, and they're one. And so it's not three in one because there's no three persons. Nowhere in the Bible does it say there's three persons. It says Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so all those are God, and so they are one substance. And so if you find, look, if you argue with the Catholics, you argue with, um, the pro even Protestants, and you argue with the Orthodox and in, in the Messianic Jews that believe in Trinitarianism, they will tell you, um, they will tell you that, um, each ad means a compound unity when it when it's singular, and so. Yes. Um, the Unitarians are wrong. The Trinitarians are wrong. The Muslims are wrong. Um, all because of the reason that God is one substance. And it says that Titus 2.13, that Jesus is God. Mm. 
And 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 to touch base with what you said, you know, uh, it's interesting because the Unitarians, I would put it in this way, Unitarians, they understand that God is a single being, but yet they reject the deity of that same God who appeared as man, who became yeah. flesh. They yeah. deny the son, which which is a term. It's a nominative term that is identifying the same God, but yeah. distinguishing that same God from God in the heavens, in the, in the celestial flesh. realm, and, and in, the, in the earthly realm, in the flesh, exactly. Yeah. So um, we, we already have this in the Old Testament, like in Genesis 18. I mean, Genesis 18 is a lovely, you know, a get-to-go passage, a cha whole chapter talking about God appearing in the plains of Mamre. Uh, and that word appear is so important because it's talking about God actually being visible. And we know the scripture says no man has seen God. So when God appears, he literally makes himself visible, but in a familiar form. And I'm using the term familiar because I can relate to you because you're a human being, as I am a human being. We have features, we, we have a shape, we have a very distinctive uh, um, form, which we can identify and we can relate. But how can we relate to a spirit? And this is, this is why you see like in two kings, for instance, I forget which verse, but there was this young man with Elisha, the prophet, who... Uh, when they were um, uh, surrounded by the Syrians, Elisha perceived in the supernatural realm. We were talking with Brother Paul about the supernatural realm because we could relate to our story about, you know, how when we were living in our life of sin, I used to take drugs. And, um, you know, that, that realm is a real realm, brothers and sisters. Anyone hearing, that realm is real. Even people that are not Christians can express it in their own words saying that realm that parallel realm exists and that's what the bible has been talking about god exists in that unseen unseen realm and paul talks about the third heaven so i would identify god residing in the third heaven and that realm man cannot perceive because it's too glorious god is like fire scripture says that the lord is a is a you know, is a is a devouring fire. And we see in the book of uh, Revelation, we see Jesus, the same God described with eyes of flame. I mean, that's pretty outlandish. When you think of it, it defies um, the, the laws of logic, because we cannot relate to that language, because we're still living in the flesh, we're still living in the carnal realm. So I know um, I'm, I'm going on that route, brother. I need to get back to uh, Tertullian and, and Praxis. But I just needed to to share this because a lot of Trinitarians, they forget that, you know, God resides in the unseen. And it's not because, you know, we cannot see a spirit, that a spirit has no form. Because there is clearly passages in the Psalms in the the prophets like isaiah isaiah saw the glory of god which god was he speaking about was he talking about a, tr a trinity a tri-personal god you know he was talking about the same god but god allowed him he opened his spiritual eyes to see in the realm that is forbidden we cannot see yeah. into that realm so, yeah, I um, want to i want to add something to that too real quick go um, ahead go ahead i'm, this, I'm stimulating this, your brain <laughs> the the DMT, yeah, the DMT. They, people will say it takes you to like um, the metaphysical of hell. And so, um, when when you look in the Bible, it says he God punished angels into Tartarus. And so, even angels can sin, and he can punish them. Then he can also punish you. But also, um, side note, I want to move to the next one. Um, people's argumentation about the Trinity. This is what I had like a little brain fart about. Um, last last time i was talking um orthodox catholics and um all these people they make the same argument with the messianic jews the trinity is triune because it's three persons 
And so none of those words are in the Bible. And so they use the word Trinity to back up the Trinity doctrine. They use the word triune sure. to back up the word Trinity doctrine. And they use um, three persons. And none of those are in the Bible. So it's called circular reasoning. And that's why that argument is completely <laughs> debunked. Because your source can't be your you. You can't be the source. Uh, the Trinity is triune because there's three persons. And, and who said that? Nobody besides you and other Catholics. <laughs> and so that, I just want to put that part in real quick. I, I'm trying not to, to laugh too hard because then I will be accused of not showing grace to my enemies. Yeah. So <laughs> anyways, but I totally relate with you, brother. And um, uh, can I just quickly share this, uh, brother uh, Paul, um, before I pass it over to you, if ever you have like your uh, Abba Father is just uh, trying to uh, transmit a very particular message, just feel free. Um, I'm just going to share this. This is um, uh, the treatise from uh, Tertullian against Praxis. A must read, brothers and sisters, because you really have to know this. You have to know your <coughs> history. And, um, you know, the, the prophet said, you know, my people die for lack of knowledge. So we, we don't want to find ourselves in this camp and we have to know our history. So I'm just going to um, uh, share this. And it's uh, it's in this part. Um, are you seeing are you seeing what I'm sharing, uh, Brother Paul? I just um, want to be sure that I'm I'm sharing this. Yeah, I can see it. But I, I it's just my browser that's. Uh... On the um, large screen. Yeah. Okay. So I think it's showing properly yeah. now. Okay, great. So um, this is... Um, I'm, I'm going to share this quickly. There we go. So um, he says uh, in this version, um, uh, it says here, ordinary Christians, ordinary Christians hold fast to the idea of monarchy from fear of polytheism okay and this is uh, tied to where Tertullian says in his day the majority were uh, saying we hold to the monarchia which means uh, it's from the Greek it means the ruling of one of one being of one individual so already this um, uh, introduction to this um, version to this um, uh, version of uh, Tertullian against Praxis, this um, uh, commentary here says identifies correctly that the first Christians were uh, modalist, were monarchians. Ordinary Christians hold fast to the idea of monarchy from fear of polytheism. Yes, because you would be breaking, you would be violating the greatest rule of faith, which is Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Basically, one master, one ruler. So you're violating Matthew 6.24. You're, you're violating Deuteronomy 6, verse 13 to 15. You're violating a whole... Uh, amount of uh, passages where God clearly is a jealous God and he is the sole ruler. He is the, the sole object of worship. Tertullian yeah. analyzes the idea of monarchy and points out in the case of a earthly monarchy, the power of the sole ruler is not impaired by devolution of certain powers to his subordinates. So already in this um, short introduction, um, this um, commentary rightly identifies uh, this quote of, uh, of Tertullian, where this is the specific quote, and I'm just going to bring you the, the, the specific quote because it's a specific quote. And here is the quote. The quote is the following all simple people, this is Tertullian speaking, all simple, simple people, not to say the unwise and unprofessional who always constitute the majority of believers, since even the rule of faith, and this was the title of tonight, the rule of faith is the Shema, Deuteronomy yeah. 6, four. Now exactly. he put like some, yeah, he put like some commentary here, annotations with other passages in the New Testament. But the rule of faith is always harking back to the rule of faith of the Hebrews. Yeah. Itself removes them from the plurality of the gods. You see, that's 
plurality, that's worshipping other gods, where there are stark warnings from God. Uh, yeah, to I want to I want to add real quick. Go ahead, that, go ahead, go that, ahead, um, please, please. It's just just like <laughs> it's just like Egypt, how they left Egypt was because they were polytheists in Egypt, and the Jews yes. had to leave Egypt and to be a monotheistic um, culture. And and then you go to, oh, am I there? Uh oh. Oh no. Sorry, I was muted. Um, Brother Paul uh, is going to come back on. Um, actually, I was just telling him because this, I think this is new and Paul um, is not um, really uh, um, uh, acquainted with this technology of ch shifting screens and putting a full screen on and I totally understand it I mean um, I, I had to go through a learning curve to understand all of these uh, it, it, we all have to learn and we're here for learning hey brother Paul can you hear me Yes, yes, brother Paul. I was just saying, I'm going to put you back on full screen again. You know, you know what the problem was. I, was... I have my Bluetooth on. No, ah. you're perfect there. You're perfect. I was actually yeah. saying to the audience that I put you on full screen so they could hear what you were saying, and I had to go through a learning curve with technology. So I, I okay. might have put Look. you off when I was playing with the the screens. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to just add that um, in Egypt they were. Um, Poly polytheists and um, Jews were monotheists and that's why they were in bondage they were in slavery until they left Egypt and they were monotheists again and so when you look at all the um, cultures that were surrounding Israel they were all pagans they were all um, polytheists and pagans and so the whole thing was don't mix the culture with the other cultures don't don't mix the jewish religion with the other cultures don't mix it with the greeks don't mix it with baal worshipers don't worship uh mix it with the egyptians and so that's that's a clear thing and so when you take um hermeticized um ideology right you took you take hermes trismegistus of the catholic church and you put it on your cathedral floor at the siena cathedral in italy then it's uh, you can see the connection all the way from Hellenized Egypt to Greece to the anti Nicene fathers to the Catholic Church. And so um, the Hermes Trismegistus um, mosaic on the floor proves that the, the Freemasonry that's within the Catholic Church with the Knights of Malta, the Knights Templar, um, the Jesuits, it's also um, depicted in their artwork. And their cathedral. So, if the cathedral um, has Hermes Trismegistus, which his name means thrice great, then you can see also that if they're inserting paganism wow. here from Egypt, then also they're they're inserting paganism into the Trinity because Philo of Alexandria was a Hellenized Jew who took Greek ideas and his Jewish identity and synthesized them together. And so, we don't synthesize. The, the religion no. we don't synthesize greek philosophy with uh christianity because christianity is a hundred percent true philosophy can only be a certain percent true so if a, if your ideology isn't a hundred percent true it's garbage it has nothing to do with christianity you can't say um yes plato was right about this yes um aristotle was right about this and stoics were right about this but you got to realize christianity was right about everything and so that's why when Paul went to uh, the Greeks and he went to he debate them, he was using their philosophy yes. to debunk them yeah. Yeah. Um, with their own ideas. And so he wanted to bring them to Jesus Christ. So he related to them on their level and not that he, not that Christianity is compatible with Greek philosophy, which it's completely not compatible with. A Greek philosophy and so that's the mistake that the Orthodox and Catholic Church make is they mix Greek philosophy when St. Paul never wanted to to mix philosophy with the Christian religion oh no and I, I 
actually uh, 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 join with what you were uh, stating, Brother Paul. Uh, I just wanted to add to what reinforce what you were saying. Uh, when when Brother Paul is talking about philosophy, basically, brothers and sisters, philosophy in just a few words is men trying to rationalize God with their finite minds. That's philosophy. You're trying to rationalize God with your carnal mind. So these men who are trying to develop the, the Trinity from the scriptures, our scriptures, and even altered, and I'm going to get to this, brother, <coughs> there's been a lot of tampering and altering. One of them is, is 1 John 5, 7. I'm sure you're, you're quite acquainted with that um, debate. But um, we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that these men were trying to rationalize the scriptures with their finite minds. So they weren't born again. They never received the Holy Spirit. They never had a relationship with God. So they were just trying to take these passages in their finite minds. I just wanted to to share that. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Uh, I was going to say something, but I, I froze for a second. Um, yeah, the Greek philosophy is what uh, influenced the Athanasian forgery. And so even some Catholics will admit that Athanasius Creed is a forgery. And it came after um, Athanasius died and somebody did it in his name. And so um, it's incorrect anyways, um, because the oneness doctrine is correct, that God is the father. Um, the Holy Spirit is God. Jesus is God. And he was sent through the Holy Spirit to um, become a man. And so and die for our I sins, mean, resurrect. And I so, um, again, you just see Greek philosophy is all the mistakes throughout um, the Christian history is, is why why these councils are being formed. It's, all, it's always over Greek philosophy. Amen. And to... to um tie with what brother paul is saying just going back to that quote again from um, Ad, um tertullian against praxis we'll get to adolf harnack in a in a in a couple of minutes but here he clearly says you know um this idea of the logos christology was removing the rule of faith um from the one true god and was bringing them closer to the plurality of the gods this world to the one true God become greatly terrified through the failure to understand while he must be believed to be one, it is along with his economy. So you see, he's adding to the Shema. He's literally saying, oh yeah, he's one, but it's oh, yeah. also with adding, the economy. Exactly. And this term, the economy, it's talking about the Logos Christology, the eternal son. It's the doctrine of the eternal uh, meaning. I'm just going to stop this. Uh, basically, the doctrine of the eternal son is the doctrine that states that God, the father, had a relationship with the son eternally before the world was created. They both preexisted together. Not he creating the sun as the Arians, you know, kind of lean towards that um, theology. But the Trinitarians properly believed, uh, and they got this from Philo, like uh, Brother Paul was stating earlier on, um, that this um, a sun was a god, but equal to the, the almighty god. You see how that circular reasoning and they both pre-existed and they were in relationship, in a loving relationship. Exactly. Started with that. But it, you, you know, it sounds so retarded. <laughs> because when we understand the term son, it's always denoting a being that is born. It's never, never talking about um, spiritual beings that are equated to God, the Father. So that already is circular reasoning uh, when you're saying that he was already a son in eternity and then he becomes again a son on earth. That is a self-defeating argument because exactly. it's, not, it's, it's unnecessary to have such a doctrine. It's uh, incoherent. 
Yeah, I just, wanted, I just wanted to read this one thing from my post. That's what I'm looking up real quick. Um, it was just about how um, Unitarians, Muslim, and all of them have it wrong. Um, just give me one second. Yeah, sure. Um, well, basically, it was about... Uh, brothers and sisters. Oh, I can't find it. Basically, it was about um, how if Muslims believe in Jesus and Mary um, and the Quran says uh, you if you I'm, I'm not saying it word for word, but it says if you do not uh, believe in the Torah or the gospel, you have nothing to stand on. And so if you read the Torah and the gospel, the, the, the gospel says a Messiah will be coming. Uh, the Torah Torah says a Messiah will be coming. Um, uh, the Gospel says Jesus is the Messiah, and the Quran says Jesus is a prophet, basically, and Mary is also existing in there. So the story of the Abrahamic faith all lines up to one story. It's not a made-up story. It's just three different people who have it interpreted it wrong. And so, if if uh, they all believe in Jesus and they all believe in the Messiah besides the Jews, but Messianic Jews believe in Jesus. So you could say all Jews, Christians and Muslims believe in Jesus. Um, you would have to say that the Quran says you have nothing to stand on unless you believe the Torah and the gospel. And so we know what the Torah and the gospel says. So that mean that would have to mean that they would have to submit to the fact that Jesus is divine. Right. And so it's the same idea with the Gnostics, the materialists and the Unitarians. They deny Christ's divinity and they do this because they say, I do not understand how Jesus could uh, how God could be a man in the flesh. And if you see that it says in the Bible, it says the word can dwell amongst us. The word can come here. It can leave. The word can um, do all these things. And so if it, it's very consistent with Sola Scriptura. And the funny thing is that Protestants, even that they take the Trinity doctrine, they say they're Sola Scriptura. They're not Sola Scriptura because if they were, they would be believing in oneness doctrine and they would yes, um, yes. toss out the Trinity as um, pagan uh, Catholic lies. And so... That's why the Trinitarians also wrong Amen. because there is no such thing as three persons in the Bible. And so all those people are wrong and there only can be one truth that Jesus is God. He came on the earth in the flesh. He died, resurrected for our sins and he went back because he's the same substance as God. Man. And it, it makes perfect sense. Um, if you, if you know your scriptures, brothers and sister, sisters, um, it clearly Bailing the story that man was created in God's image. So basically, um, the scriptures teach that Adam had the divine essence. Um, I'm going to go in deep on this, brothers and sisters. Uh, Adam had the divine essence. When it's using the term in Genesis uh, chapter chapter 1 and 2, uh, when it's talking about man was created in the image of God, it's not just the shape of man it's the spiritual man in heaven i'm talking about god the father about man what possessed the essence of god so he was divine this is why you find in psalms 8 i'm not mistaken did i not say ye are gods but ye shall die now, this is showing the mortality of man uh, after the disobedience of Adam and Eve. Uh, we inherited this virus, okay? And this is what we call the flesh, sin. No longer able to be in God's presence, to see him face to face. That word in the Greek is a, a pro, pro, a pros, a pros, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, in the Hebrew it's um uh, i forget which term it is in the hebrew face to face um uh, but but that basically is talking about a relationship with god so when adam sinned all of his offsprings were contaminated and god knew that one day he had to fix that from inside this earthly realm he couldn't fix it from the outside in his divine 
uh, pre-existing position. He had to literally become a man in order to fix that from within. Not only had to become man, but he had to carry the sin of man after sinful flesh, as uh, the Apostle Paul, uh, Apostle Paul uh, teaches in the book of Hebrews. Read the book of Hebrews because it's teaching you uh, the uh, origin of Jesus Christ as the uh, second Adam, the man from heaven, the, the Lord of heaven, if you will. So the original, the original man, brothers and sisters, is God himself. God is not a formless um, a vacuum, a formless being or an energy like the New Age teachers or the Hindus believe in or the Buddhists. God is literally a person and we're the only creation that has this distinct uh, feature, this face. And the amount of times the face is um, spoken about in scripture, I don't know if it's more than a hundred scriptures pertaining to the to the face. And uh, it's that the, the face, the glory of God will be in the face of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 8 to 9, uh, you know, Philip says, you know, show us the father. And Jesus responds, have I not been so long with you, Philip? He that ha and you have not known this revelation. He that has seen me, that's visibly he that has seen my face has seen the father. The Hebrews knew this. Job made a prayer in Job 19. He literally made a prayer and he said, I will see God in my flesh. My redeemer lives. That's the end of John uh, Job 19. Job literally makes a prayer because he's so desperate. He's got, you know, all of these ulcers. He's got all of these plagues that he's um, received from Satan during the debate between God and Satan. And he's literally making this plea, this call. It's a call of desperation. And this is the call of desperation of every human beings. We want to see a God that can relate to our condition. How would you want to have a relationship with a, a formless God that you can't even relate to? Brother Paul, I, I'm, I know I'm really, I'm going, I'm going way out there, but I really felt the Holy Spirit urging me to talk about this because we need, we need to relate to our creator. How can you relate to a creator if he's a chicken? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think um, everything that you, everything that like you can perceive is just an illusion. And so even if you perceive as something having power is just an illusion and that's your carnal mentality of perceiving mm. it that way. And so obviously we do not know how God um, what cre how God existed like at the beginning before what we're told in the Bible. We do not know how God came about. That's the mystery. We do not. But the Trinity is not the mystery. And so that's that, that mm. the Catholics, they like to tell you the Trinity is the mystery. The Trinity is not the mystery. It's told to us in the Bible. The mystery is how God came into existence. We just believe that Amen. it's real. And that's what the truth. Amen. And so anything that like you see like these in um, different different religions, it's called the trickster God. And so they're just the devil manifest different ways. And so just the way like God manifests. The devil is a trickster and he tries to copy God and he's he's never going to have the same power as God. He's going to always want the same authority as God. And that's why he was rebellious. And that's why they, the the angels in heaven that sin go to Tartarus and they're and they're punished. And so there's no escaping God, even if you're an angel. Amen. Amen, brother. I, I wonder. And in in relating. I'm going to just quickly share this. Um, this is from a book called The Muggletonian Principles Prevailing, okay? And this is a group of uh, Christians back in the 17th century that not many people are acquainted with. But they would be what we, we, we would uh, brand as modalists, as monarchians. And uh, you have to understand, brothers and sisters, Brother John, you know, during that time, this was during the time of the Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell's regime in England. So the Trinity doctrine was actually an official doctrine of the Church of England. 
And if you denied the Trinity, you would be fined, you would go to prison, or you would be tortured and literally be uh, killed, martyred. So uh, denying the Trinity could get you in serious trouble. And not many printers were willing to, um, you know, to vocalize your thoughts or your um, disagreements with the Church of England. You needed a license. So people printing in that time um, were heavily suppressed by uh, Trinitarians. So I'm, I just want to read this. It's uh, from Tom Thomas Tomkinson. Uh, he was what we would call a, a Muggletonian. Uh, uh, this is uh, from um, John Reeve and Ludovic Muggleton, who were the first uh, founders of this. Uh, you, you would call it a sect nowadays. Um, yeah. But they had a lot of things right. Um, I don't agree with every single statement from the um, movement, but I do believe a lot of what they have to share. And the oneness of God, they got right. They okay. Right off the bat, they understood the oneness of God. And I'm going to read it here. Um, he's This, this um, apologist, this uh, theologian, uh, Thomas Tomkinson of this uh, same branch, uh, is talking about Sibelius. So they wrote, they didn't write the same way we write now, uh, but Sabulus, Sabalus is Sibelius. So it's talking about the same person. So he says here, very interesting, Sibelius, the bishop, being about 200 years after Christ, so he's got that right, I mean, the dates and all, and Noatius was a contemporary with him. So that this being in the time of the 10 persecutions, there was truth then in the world. You see, he's talking about this time of the early church, where truth, the gospel was being preached, the unblemished, untainted gospel, not the gospel you're hearing about now. And a trinity of persons, look at this, brother, a trinity mm. of persons in one Godhead had not got footing at that time during the ten, <laughs> 10 persecutions he's literally <laughs> buying the truth and it's yes. it, you see they didn't have a license to write this it was illegal to, yes. to write this sort of like a quick comment on that he, he's 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 wow um fantastic well, that, quote that that has to tie in that kind of ties in with the Christian nationalist uh, idea that I was professing was because in Rome um, they suppressed Martin Luther and he was denying the Trinity and in um, England and the UK they were suppressing um, anti-Trinitarians as well and so that's why the creation of America was created was so that Christians were not persecuted by the state by um, either the King of England or the v Pope of the Vatican could not condemn Christians for their different beliefs with Christianity, with different sects. So you could practice if you were Puritan, you could practice if you're Protestant, you could practice if you're a pilgrim, whatever. And so um, that was the superior idea because um, just because, um, just because you're in power doesn't mean that you should force convert people because Forced conversion has never been a real way to convert people to the word of God. Um, there's plenty of like debates that you could have um, education, you know, TV nowadays. You, you, there's plenty of ways to convince people that God is real. You don't have to um, use the state as a power to force convert people or do an inquisition. You don't have to do that. that that's so interesting. We have a sister. Uh, uh, brother Paul at uh, Harry Potter all of the Harry Potter I've been more of a Lord of the Rings guy but uh, in Harry Potter they called those with power muggles That's yeah muggles so yeah <laughs> muggle blood yeah you know um, a sister so um, usually these, you know, these Illuminatis, the Freemasons, these occultists, they usually use a lot of um, real history and they insert it in the scripts in Hollywood to try oh, and, yeah. you know, appeal to the subconscious mind. And somewhere when people will hear the truth, 
they will identify it with the latest uh, episodes, the latest series that they've been viewing. They're very smart, and that's the the works of the devil. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did a quick look up on the on the Muggle Muggleton and just because I read your uh, info thing on the in the description, and that's what the first thing I found was that it said Harry Potter. <laughs> so that that is <laughs> funny that you said that. Yeah. So, um, anyways, I'm going to bring this back, and uh, it's so. Um, and you see, it, I love um, I love um, Brother Paul um, mentioning, you know, how the how the forefathers of um, the uh, America were actually real christians and they were uh, they had a oneness understanding if you know your history you'll see they were actually fleeing the trinitarian persecution at that time and this well, perfectly yeah. ties oh go ahead well go listen ahead, brother. to this please one nation under god indivisible right so yes. that's what that's what indivisible. that's what they left us with that's what they told us too is that <laughs> one nation under god indivisible what is indivisible it's of one accord just like pentecost yeah, you can't divide it. Yeah, yeah. Makes so and during sense. Pentecost, they came together on one one accord, and then the one Holy accord. Spirit came down on them, and that's the same thing. Indivisible with li- li- with liberty and justice for all. That same phrase is um, indivisible, and so that's that's what that reminds me is that it's one accord, indivisible. Yes. Um, different Christians, um, God will work through different outlets to spread the uh, gospel. Um, and and we can come together even though we have differences just like the story of pentecost Amen. and Amen. and the sad story is we know the story later on uh they departed a lot they put, a lot of um these men and women departed from the faith and now we know uh, the one dollar bill we know the story of the one dollar bill with the great pyramid with the all-seeing eye if you read it uh in latin you have the words e pluribus unum which means uh, out of many, one, one. order. One yeah. order. You see that? Yeah. So it started with indivisible, and my dear brother, it ended with pluribus, with many. But we're going to come out of Babylon when, 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 when Jesus will appear. We'll be yeah, I really feel like it's a curse. I really feel like the Trinity is a curse. It's like the same thing with like a witch's covenant. They believe in the Trinity as well. They believe in covenants as well. Um, as Christians, we believe in a covenant as well, but we don't believe in the yes. Trinity, but other Christians yeah. do. And so they'll have like the Led Zeppelin symbol, um, pagan symbol, um, as their Presbyterian church or whatever like that. And so these people are just as lost as the Catholics. They think they're um, better than the Catholics, and they do all this uh, exegesis against the Catholic Church. But then they'll have the um, Trinity doctrine wrong, which is the main doctrine that you're supposed to be, you're supposed to have that correct. Yeah, yeah. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. I, I'm just, I'm just going to pull this up again, brother uh, Paul, and I'm really enjoying your, uh, your presence, brother. It's so encouraging to have a, a true brother that has been awakened. Uh, yep, I appreciate it too Father. because I, I keep getting gatekeep by all these um, establishment Christians that are influencers on the internet. So when, when people like you, uh, there's, a, I'm going to give a shout out to a few people. The, the guy who wrote Philo's Trinity. Um, his name is Approved of God on Approved YouTube. Approved of God. Um, the another guy is um, he's a Canadian guy. I can't think of his name. Um, right off the, the top guy's of my name head, Raul, I think it's. But Raul. he's another one. This guy, and uh, he's also. And then I found your channel, and these three channels really are what led me to the truth. And so I'd like other people also, if you're listening to, um, subscribe to those same people because. If you watch all their videos, I'm sure you will come to the same conclusion as me. Um, let's see Amen. channels. I've been trying to get Brother Paul um, approved of God Raul on on the, this channel to um, to hear a uh, you know him uh, describing a lot of uh, his work and his book Philo's um, Philo's Trinity. Yeah. So uh, I've been trying. I've been contacting him, and he's been responding back to me and. We're just working through a couple of dates where he can come on. Um, last time he got cancelled, he was he was going to come on, but yes, this is the endeavor, brother. We're trying to we're trying to be um, to reassemble because we've been scattered. We're like the scat- scattered tribes of Israel, and we really are. 
spiritually speaking the, the, the there is the the literal physical descendants of israel the 144000 i believe that but we're also part of that covenant we are yeah uh, and so included. um I, I think a lot of people are easily um agreeing with us I think that the establishment people make it seem like so many people agree with them. Philosophers agree with them. Historians agree with them. Scholars agree with them. Every uh, major Christian religion agrees with them. But it's false. When you explain that God is one, Jesus is God, people accept that right away. And so we're mm. supposed to be childlike, you know, to receive the Holy Spirit, right? And so we're also supposed to be able to be apt to teach. And so when you're doing all this economic trinities, you're doing these Greek philosophies, you're doing all these uh, like big words, like the Calvinists. Like if you're a Calvinist, you'll say big words and you'll think it's like, wow, that guy's really smart. And you'll look up what it means. It just means something like not that interesting. And so they do that trick. Like they, they play with the etymology. They play word games. They say, no, you don't understand Hebrew. No, you don't understand Greek. You're not, a, you didn't get a master's degree in Protestantism and Catholicism like uh, Michael Brown. And so you're a Pharisee now and you talk down to people that they don't know Hebrew. And so that's the situation that we're dealing with is a bunch of gatekeeping people that are not trying to save people. They're not trying to help people. They're not trying to guide people. They're trying to sell their book. They're trying to gain authority and they're trying to, that's it. They're just trying to sell their book and they're just trying to gain authority. Like, listen to me, be part of my flock. I'll lead you. Uh, like they're trying to gather the sheep, but it's, it's not to like teach them the real doctrine of Jesus Christ. It's just like, so other people won't gather the sheep. You understand what, you know, it's like gatekeeping. Like I feel if you. nobody, if I can't get these sheep, then nobody gets them and I'm going to keep lying. And so that's the situation that we're in. It's so devilish and it's so uh, it's uh, it's such a deception. Uh, I, I want to get back to what I was um, uh, sharing, brother, uh, because it ties perfectly with what you were uh, sharing. Uh, yeah. It's so important to know um, your your church history. Um, so he goes on and he says, "But after religion was set up by imperial power, you were mentioning this in our chat earlier on, brother Paul." He's literally talking about the Council of Nicaea, uh, Thomas Tomkinson, saying after religion was set up by imperial power, then bishops were chosen out of learned philosophical men. There you go. Just confirming what Brother Paul has been saying, what we've been saying um, throughout this live discussion and yeah. churches as they called them you see because i don't agree with the term church brother uh, the original term was assembly assembly yeah. if you go to the uh, word church it comes from kirche in german which means you know a building belonging to a lord but not the lord you know the the tetragrammaton yod it's talking about a human ruler so people need to understand when they're using the term church we can show grace for, for those you know you know who are still you know trying to work out their faith with fear and trembling but we have to we have to come to this point where we need to study to show ourselves approved like paul wrote to timothy uh this term churches uh, originally was assembly i prefer that term and he says riches given for the support exactly what brother paul has been saying they always get the the funding they always get the the majority they always get the subscribers the majority subscribers the funding the pomp the glory um the the the, the large media attention um it, it already was happening back in in the 17th century and he goes on and he says then uh sorry third century then were synods and councils called to establish error and formal worship there you go there's your trinity synods and councils like the council yep. of nicaea to establish yep. error so people so all of the monarchians were booted out the this is the warning from paul <coughs> in acts 20 28 to 30 he literally said after my departure, 
grievous wolves will enter the flock and not spare. They did not spare the Monarchians. It was the majority, Trinitarians, <coughs> or that you would, you know, fall into the category of Arians. And that's, yeah. uh, we, we can go into that later on. Do you, well, did you want it, to, to Arian, add something to this? I want to comment on, I want to comment on Arian real quick. It's like, it wasn't the Neo Arians the one that says uh, Jesus wasn't divine? Yes. Or was that the Ar Arians, the original one? Because I'm pretty sure Arians. the ones that are doing the false doctrine are the Neo Arians. And I think that they just misrepresented Arians' ideas, right? Or, or I'm not really sure uh, about uh, that one. Arius, Ar Arius te uh, taught. Now, this was the majority. They would they would diverge in some other points. But Arius taught that Jesus was uh, ascended to godhood status. He was, he was oh. just a man. Or you had the other camp in the Aryan um, in the Aryan system that believed that Jesus pre-existed, but he was not equal to God the Father. Yeah, that's the wrong one. That's the yeah. wrong one because um, I, I know they did that with Isaac Newton when um, they said that Isaac Newton was like a Trinitarian or whatever like that, or or he uh, was a Unitarian. They tried to represent him as a Unitarian, and uh, really he Unitarian. admitted that Jesus was the same as God, and so he, that's why oh, really? that whole like triangle thing with the the rainbow coming out of it, he, it was showing that that was a covenant that God made with. Um, Noah and Jesus Oh, I'd love Christ. you to, to send me a link, a Brother Paul. If you could send me that link on Isaac Newton, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, uh, I think I, where, I where... it's um, it was on my community post or whatever like that. He went to Trinity College, and uh, that was the I ironic part because he de he ended up denying the Trinity. Um, he said that mm. Roman um, Romanism wasn't the problem; it was Trinitarian. Trinitarianism was the great heresy and that the seventh wow. seal was opened during the Council of Constantinople. And he did some deep research on 1 John 5, 7, by the way, proving it was a forgery. So uh, we're, we're definitely in agreement, Brother Paul. Uh, yeah. Isaac Newton. And, and when I, I say know. these people's names, I'm not saying like, oh, agree with Isaac Worship Newton. Worship him. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, sure, sure. for example, um, just like Martin Luther, I don't, I don't fully agree with Martin Luther with the sure, his sure. three persons doctrine, but I agree with him that the Trinity is um, a man-made doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I think he is good enough teacher that um, since Protestants in that Reformation era did not speak on the Trinity, um, like, Calvin, he said the oneness doctrine, but he also said Trinity. But so, but Martin Luther specifically said the Trinity doctrine was false, and that's why I I can uh, favor him, like because I'm a Protestant. But my doctrine goes all the way back to Saint Paul. That's the whole thing about Orthodox and Catholic Church. They try to make fun of Protestants. They'll say, "Who's your church father? Um, some guy from um, like." Eight, uh, 1940 or something like that that established like an American church or something like that. They, they make jokes like that on Twitter. But really, it's about um, like St. Paul in Antioch. That's why I put my name St. Paul in Antioch because it was a humble ch church at Antioch. It was like a monastery. It doesn't look like a Catholic church. It doesn't look like an uh, Orthodox church. It's like something that, like a Protestant would build in the woods. You know what I mean? <laughs> like something like that. And so it's, it's just like a little make. monastery. And so when you go all the way back to yeah. church fathers, they'll say, oh, my church father was John Christendom or my church father was this guy. But my church father is both Peter and Paul, but it's Paul because Paul was right in that situation at Antioch. And it was the first church that was built outside of Jerusalem. I think you will agree, Brother Paul. Uh, our church father is Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. obviously. Amen. <laughs> all the praise but Amen, when it comes brother. to establishing and writing the churches and stuff like that of paul course. also did that as well and so true, that's true. why um the pivotal point of the whole the whole theological debate outside of the trinity is what is the relation to gentiles and jews and christians mm. what is their relation are they allowed to be christian right and so that was the biggest debate at the time it was that jews did not want to allow gentiles into the fold and so they would argue with christians about allowing gentiles in 
But <laughs> really, the Bible says that we're supposed to allow Gentiles in. So I would say the Trinity debate is the biggest debate. I'd say the second biggest debate in history is about who's allowed to be, you know, Christian or whatever. But that was established early on in the church. But obviously, you see them fighting about it then. It was a big idea. And it's one of the main problems we have today with the Jews of Israel, the Zionists, the Messianic Jews, and um, the Christians is that messianic jews and protestants both have Trinitarian. authority like i would say like an authority in the so. sense that they're right about scripture and and, mm. and the fact is is that the messianic jews they will try to steal all authority right and so they recently clashed with the zionists and um in israel when they went to go do missionary work and so you can see how the jews do not accept them as jews and so they do not, the Messianic Jews do not accept us Christians mm. as Messianic Jews. They, yes. they split us. They separate yes. us because we don't put the ZT on or we don't do the, you know, uh, Tephilim. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they separate us like we're not part of the tradition. And so I understand that, that they think they're better than us. The Zionists think they're better than them. And what we need to do is unite under Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. And and the sad thing, I, I don't know if you knew this, brother, but um, I, I recently found after some research, and I posted this, it's an old video on my channel, but the, the Jews for Jesus, okay, who are Messianic Jews, uh, unfortunately have a Trinitarian uh, system. Yes. And um, they have, one of their apologists used, it was a couple years ago, they appealed to the Zohar, yeah, they Which appeal to the Kabbalistic text. text and everything. They yeah. appeal to the Kabbalistic text. And then when you talk to them and say, deal within the scripture, they can't do it. And then they'll say, oh, let's uh, speak Hebrew or whatever like that. And they'll say, you don't know how to speak Hebrew. And it's yeah. a defense mechanism. Yeah. It's 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 only only it's, uh, like black Hebrew Israelites fall for it when they like uh, Michael Brown. He's going to defeat uh, the Hebrew Israelites in a, a translation debate. Mm -hmm. But really, it's about do you know what each had translates to? Because that's more important, um, because if you don't know that God is one, Jesus is one, then you can't teach Jesus yeah. is one. Yeah. So that means you're you're not able to preach the gospel. And and a lot of these Trinitarians apologists, um, I'm not going to give the names. Uh, I don't think it's really important, but. Um, for the time being, but you know, they will appeal to the arguments of these messianic Jews that appeal to the to the Talmud, even to the Talmud, to the Zohar. And yeah. uh, it's interesting because they talk about Sephirot, they talk about the three exalted heads, thrice, you know, exalted. You've, I'm sure you've heard of that, uh, which is in the Zohar. So they see, you know, God like a three headed. Uh, ambiguous that's what Mormonism force. Believes. Yeah, that's yeah, what Mormonism. Yeah. And it's so sad because you know they they say they accept Jesus, but it's another Jesus. They're preaching another Jesus. They're preaching another gospel. So uh, our hope and our um, uh, our endeavor, as Brother Paul said, is to unite them under the true banner of Jesus Christ, the everlasting Father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is only one. So, um, no, brother, I, I totally agree. You don't mind if I just go back to this? Um, I'm just going to finish up with this. Yeah, um, go ahead. A quote. Um, he then goes on to say, um, and to suppress truth. So there you have it. To suppress truth that was ever without outward pomp and glory. So he's saying here that the original church was very humble. He was saying that they were not, you know, there for the money. They were not there for the support, the riches, uh, and that the Trinitarian camp, they were all there for the support, the riches. And I'm seeing so many of these channels, uh, Brother Paul, brothers and sisters, on YouTube that get the most views, the most support, uh, all of the funding. Uh, they're the gate gatekeepers, as yep. Brother Paul was, was sharing earlier on. Exactly. Um, and he goes, uh, go ahead. Did you want it to um, add to that, brother? Sorry. No, no, I was just agreeing with you. I was saying exactly. So, I mean, he had this Thomas Tompkinson, um, you know, he already was identified already back in the third century. And he goes on to say, thus was Noetius and Sibelius doctrine 
judged heresy, both by Trinitarians and Arian. They write it differently. They write it tres, which is from the Latin. So the T-R-E is there for the tre, tres, for the free. So they wrote a, they wrote slightly differently back in the day, but they're talking about the Trinitarians and Arians. And though they cursed, excommunicated and condemned each other by several councils as if hell was broke loose. This is why I referred to it as the great apostasy, because this was the beginning of the great apostasy. We're living now in the last uh, age, the final stages of this apostasy. And to it was for the thousand years time after, I disagree with this, I, I disagree with this part, but I will just skip to this. Uh, the Aryan being but as a branch sprouted out of the Roman Catholic Church. So they're uh, identifying the Aryans originally Trinitarians. Very interesting that Thomas Tompkinson is identifying the Aryans not as Monarchians but as Trinitarians. Although in Constantinus days and sometime <coughs> after a very great <coughs> branch, it is insomuch that the Catholics could not then boast of number. For in the council of Ariminium and Silencia, there was 560 bishops, the greatest convention that was ever known. Okay. And he goes on to say, and yet they decreed the Arian faith. I didn't even know this. So that will you Catholics say that number is an argument of truth because of the numbers. Again, they thought that if they got the numbers, it would establish truth. It's not because you've got a majority of people agreeing with you that you're founded in truth. But whichsoever of them that got the emperor of the side gained power over the other, so that both of them all do they persecuted each other with deadly hatred. You've noticed that the Arians and Trinitarians, they, they actually have a deadly rivalry between them. And yet they agree, they mostly agree with, with each other because they have a subordinate son in the sense that, you know, he's, uh, he's not almighty. Trinitarians will say that the son, Jesus, is God, but they will never say he's the almighty God, the father. They will always, you know, show that he is subordinate to the father and yet he's equal. And the well, Arians, what's, your, what's, they, what's your interpretation of Titus 2? 213 can we go to uh, can we go to that passage brother because right off the bat um well I'm yeah really i was just saying it, was, uh, <laughs> it says jesus is god uh titus, titus 213 it says um jesus is god so i just don't understand how unitarians can even think that um jesus isn't god yes 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 um uh unitarians uh that term uh is associated associated with Arians and some have wrongfully um, used it for oneness people uh, because the only area where we agree with the uh, the Arians the Unitarians is that there is only one God we agree we both agree uh, we hold to that uh, dearly uh, in contrast to the Trinitarians they have three as we have one the only disagreement between us and the Unitarians, Arians, is that they believe that the Son is not God in the sense that he is not divine. They deny his deity. He has a God yeah. title, a God title, but he is not God equal to God the Father, if that, may, if, if that makes sense. Yeah. So in regards to Titus 2, were you, um, were you um, talking about verse 13? Is that the, the, yeah. the verse in, uh, that you wanted to share? Yeah, yeah Titus uh, 2.13. Okay, I'll put it on the screen. And we'll I get only back have my to... Bible here with me. I had to look it up. It's taking me a little longer. Sure, no worries. Um, we'll get back to this um, <clears throat> interesting um, excerpt from Thomas Tompkinson, but let me just share this quickly. As Brother Paul um, has rightly um, appealed to the scriptures, 
Um, have you heard that the the this argument saying Unitarians are actually oneness? Did you hit? Did you hear that from someone? Um, no, I said I never thought Unitarians were oneness. I know that they always denied Christ, and so that they're worse than Trinitarians in my view, because yes. uh, the, the, at least Trinitarians say that True. Jesus is God. The Unitarians is God, uh, yes, and and how and how they understand God is where we uh, differ. Is that your point? Um, I, I was saying, like the Unitarians that I see on YouTube, they say that Jesus isn't God, and so that they're more of a heretic than the Trinitarian pagans, because the Trinitarian pagans, despite using paganism, they'll say Jesus is God. Okay. Can you okay, hear me? Okay. I got you. Yeah, yeah. Got you. Oh. Um, okay, I've, um, Titus 2.13. Yeah, Titus go ahead. Titus 2.13. Looking for that blessed hope in our glorious appearing of a great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. What does that mean to you? Do you think that means that Jesus is God? Amen. It does because it connects perfectly with uh, the first chapter of John 1, verse 1. It connects yeah. also to 1 John 3. Uh, how um, you know? Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we may be called sons of God. And He says that He appeared. So uh, we, we're we're talking about the same God, and that's yeah. the blessed hope. And One John three actually um, connects with Titus two verse thirteen. Um, it, you you want me to pull it up quickly? Yeah. Yeah, it's so it's so beautiful because it ties with what brother uh, Paul uh, was was sharing in Titus two, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us. So it's it's singular, first person singular. It's not talking about two people. It's one person giving Himself, one being, one individual. And if you go to one John three. Look how this perfectly uh, connects, brothers and sisters, brother John. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. You see, there's a reason why we're called sons of God when we accept Jesus Christ in our hearts and we cry to him, Abba, Father, because he is the Father. Therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Do You see, there's no change of person. It's still talking yep. about the Father. Yep. It knew him, not. That's literally word for word what John says in his uh, first, um, you know, opening in John chapter one. He literally says the world knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God yep. and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. That's the resurrection, the day of the Lord. But we know that when he shall appear Amen. we shall be like him you see how it perfectly uh connects it perfectly harmonizes with what uh, brother john was saying in the passage of titus to titus titus 2 verse 13 it literally is talking about the father who will appear and we will be like him for we shall see him as he is um can can i just share this brother in john uh in job Chapter 19, yep. it's literally yep. saying, it's literally saying we will see the Father who is no other but Jesus Christ, the everlasting Father. Job 19 literally states it in different, in a different way. Verse 25, for I know that my Redeemer liveth. That was a prophecy and that he shall stand the Mount of Olives. Read Zechariah 14. It literally says that Jesus Christ, the Lord, will stand on the Mount of Olives at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I <laughs> shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. There you go, your Trinity in the bin not another though my reins be consumed within me you see in my flesh i shall see god how can you see a spirit well obviously you know god is going to appear as a glorified body on earth 
that perfectly connects to 1 John 3 and uh, Titus 2, verse 13. What, what yeah. do you think of that, Brother Yeah, brother I John? think that's, um, that's more proof than I even had. I didn't. I didn't put that together. I just had the uh, Titus 2.13 because I was arguing with the Unitarians. I was like, I can't believe they don't believe Jesus is God. Like I thought it says in the Bible that Jesus is God. And then I'm looking at Titus 2.13 and it says flat out Jesus is God. Yeah. And so I just gave it to them and they still don't get they still don't get it. I don't know if they're doing it on purpose or if they're mm. playing a game or they're just spiritually blocked from the truth. Like. And, but, and the appearing, you know, like you just shared that in Titus 2, verse 13. And we go to 1 John 3. It's talking about the Father. Yeah. It's not talking about, you know, the Son, a subservient entity, a subservient uh, being, you know, who is one with the Father. It's talking about the same person saying he will appear. And then yeah. we see other passages. It's talking Jesus is the one who appears. And he is exactly. called the great God and Savior. And we know in, the, in, in Isaiah, it says, there is no Savior besides me. I know no other God, none. So, um, you know, Isaiah 48, verse 11, uh, I will not yield my glory to another. Another. We went to Job 19, verse uh, around 26 to 28. He literally says, Job, I will see God for myself and not another. And another, if you go to the Hebrew, I can I can quickly pull this, if um, if you don't mind, uh, yeah. brother Paul. No, I love, I love listening to it. I mean, it, it's just so amazing. If we go to the uh, Hebrews concordance, I just want to go to Isaiah quickly because you see in Job nineteen he uses that same word and not another in verse twenty seven. This perfectly um, this perfectly ties with Isaiah and I'm going to go to Isaiah there's also Isaiah 42 verse 8 I think we can go to um, Isaiah 42 verse 8 literally I am the Lord that is my name and my glory will I not give to another so if we go to the Strong's Concordance we go to the Hebrew and look what it says get this brothers and sisters this is so neat Another is Strong's Concordance, Acher. And that is the word another. And if you want more precision on that word, it's called properly one coming behind. Okay, someone is coming after, you know, someone that is, you know, before you. And we know Jesus has said that he was before all things. So someone, you know, who is called God cannot be behind, you know, that first being. And it literally says here, Strong's exhaustive concordance, another man following next strange. That's very precise. So other in Hebrew was always associated with someone that is next to an individual. And this is why, brother, you know, people that use this argument of the right hand of God, they don't understand. They don't it's understand that. The, yeah, it's a Hebrew idiom. The right hand, there is, a, there is a passage in Proverbs where it says, my heart is at the right hand. Yeah. What, what, what does that mean? It means my heart is at the right hand. If I'm taking that literally, it's, a, it, it's an expression. It's an idiom, and uh, the scriptures are full of figurative speech, full of allegories, you know, where you're trying to, to, to show an analogy through, you know, symbols. That is the authority, right? Yes, authority. Yeah. So um, that makes sense, you know. Yeah. It, otherwise, you have this passage we've just read in Isaiah 42, verse 8. It doesn't make any sense that Stephen is seeing Jesus next to God the Father, you would have a violation of the Shema because you have Isaiah literally saying, I will not yield my glory to next, to someone next to me. <laughs> He's literally saying, I'm the only one that has that glory. 
Yeah, you 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 have to ask those people that always make this argument. They do it to me too. I say, what do you what are you gonna see in heaven? Yes, right? and they nice, and, and they don't, and they tell <laughs> me the the always the wrong thing that like what you just told me. Yeah, no, no it makes it makes perfect sense, uh, uh, and uh, I love it. What um, Sister Sher said, it's a pictorial language. Yeah, and if you look at Paleo Hebrew. It actually had symbols, and it was it, the way that it was um, writ. You had letters that resembled, um, you know, like um, hands. You had, you know, like sort of animal sort of figures in the Paleo Hebrew. So it was a very figurative way of speaking. Not always. Sometimes it was very plain, and it always got to me, brother. You know, when the disciples said. You know, speak to us plainly. Expression yeah. in English, plain means simple. Tell us, and that's what they don't understand. These, I'm sorry, but a lot of these Trinitarians, apologists, they are using simple language to the carnal brain, to the carnal mind. The Trinity is not a mystery. It's simple. Even a child can understand it. But to understand the revelation of God, the Father becoming a man, now that's a revelation. That's the mystery of godliness. God appeared in the flesh. And uh, that's our salvation. If you understand that God, the Father, was crucified on the tree, his beard was ripped, he was butchered, he bled as a man. That's a humbling experience. As, as a man, you should be humbled. As a sinner, you should be humbled. God left his throne and he literally became a son. Now that is a, the, the salvation. That's the gospel, um, the good news. That's the salvation of God. Yeah, that's why I love the thief on the cross story. The uh, penitent thief, how he, one thief ignored Jesus on the left. And on his right hand side uh, was the thief who believed in him, went to heaven, even though he was a convicted criminal, never was baptized, never was a Christian, and then accepted Christ mm. right before he died and went to heaven. That's why I like that story, not just because it's a way to like get around all the yes. um, the traditions and stuff like that. It's the fact that once you get enough clarity, like you don't want to get around. Uh, you don't want to cheat to get to heaven. You want to go to heaven the real way. But knowing that even on your deathbed that you can repent to Jesus and go to heaven is good news to me. That's that's the good news of the gospel to me, too, as well. I mean, you know, brother, you know, when you weigh those words of Job in Job 19, verse 27, I believe it was in verse 27, when see God with my eyes of flesh. That makes perfect sense with Zechariah 12.10. They will look upon me. That's God the Father speaking me. doesn't say him. doesn't say they will look upon him, the son, uh, a distinct individual who is my son. He's saying they will look upon me whom they have pierced. That's why Thomas in Thomas 20, uh, uh, Thomas 20, my bad, John 20 verse 28 where Jesus literally says to Thomas, look, feel, feel my hands, you know, put your, your hands in, in, my, uh, in my wounds. And Thomas says, my Lord and my God. He literally worshipped him. He said, my Lord, my Adonai, my master and my Elohim, my God. I mean, that if for a Hebrew to utter that, he was not thinking of a trinity. He was thinking of God the Father in the flesh showing wounds i mean my heart would drop my heart would drop you know understanding the creator became a baby became a child and he literally allowed himself to be killed in a cruel manner for our sins brother for your sins for my sins for 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 the the the, the sins of our parents brother for the people that have left us, for the people that have wronged us, he died for those sins. He took responsibility. If that's not a loving God, well, I don't know what is. Then you're preaching another God. 
God is not even willing to step down from his throne. He's sending another being to do his dirty work. If God is love, he will take responsibility. He'll say, I will give my own life. And the, the sons and daughters who will be um, revealed this mystery, they will follow me with all of their hearts. With all of their hearts and soul, mind and strength. That makes perfect sense to me. Not a logos, a subservient God. Because then I'm, who am I worshipping? I'm, I'm, I'm not really worshipping God the Father. I'm worshipping this being called the Father. I'm worshipping this being called the Son. I'm worshipping the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm an unfaithful bastard. I'm sorry. I, I don't have a relationship with a soul ruler. I don't have a relationship with a father. I have a relationship with multiple partners. One called the Father, one called the Son, one called the Holy Spirit. And this and is another why one many called like... Mary. Yeah. This <laughs> is why Trinity. Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton, all of these theologians that came out from Babylon, they, they got this. Didn't make any sense when they were praying. They were like, what am I praying? I'm like, I I'm sounding like a Roman. I'm sounding like an Egyptian now. I'm, I'm sounding <laughs> like... <laughs> So um, I, I was thinking about something too. Um, I just it just uh, escaped my mind. But um, I'm sorry. The, oh, the Catholic uh, <laughs> Trinity was that not only do they believe in the Trinity, they believe in a quadrinity. They pray directly to Mary. So it's not just the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're also trying to intercede with Mary. So it's four. So it's True. even more ridiculous the more you go into it because the Orthodox <laughs> Church also prays to Mary. They pray to the Theotokos. And yes. so if you're praying, if you're praying, you think you can have Mary intercede for you. So it's a false doctrine. It's, it's a Byzantine schism of the Catholic doctrine of praying to Mary. And so of <clears throat> I just wanted to add that point. Another point I wanted to add was the Trisagion prayer that they uh, have is that it says, holy, 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 which is a scripture where it's uh, holy, um, something holy, immortal. And it's all referencing to the titles of jesus uh the holy spirit and god which are one substance and so just because they're called um holy is just designating the title of div divinity and so mm. holy means divinity and so that's why in the old testament you never see um trinitarians even mention the tristigy on prayer of the holy 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 because they know it's directed all praise to god and so um yeah, there's two Trinity things I wanted to knock out. Um, and uh, I can't think of the other one. Maybe I'll come back after you attack. <laughs> maybe maybe um, our Heavenly Father, brother, is calling you to be an apologist. What, uh, on, the, on YouTube? Who knows? Yeah, who knows? We're, we're on the, wherever on the street, YouTube, wherever he leads us. Uh, I, I think that you've, um, you've acquired a lot of this knowledge from, from him. Where else? Yeah. Where else can you get it from? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I hope I hope I could spread the gospel. That's what I really would like to do. But it, it is it's whatever happens happens. You know what I mean? If I do it for five minutes, if I do it for uh, a couple months, or I do it for twenty years, I don't care. Like uh, I, I I'm still gonna still I'm still gonna have my ideas with me, and um, I'm still gonna believe and what God I is, believe. And and God is working on our, our personality. I, I totally understand that. Yeah. Uh, same here. Same here, brother. He's uh, he's chiseling away at the gold nugget. <laughs> <You're>, <laughs> we'll become sometimes this I feel like sometimes I feel like I'm I'm placed somewhere here, and then sometimes I'm thrown somewhere else. <laughs> and so wherever I need to be is where I guess I'm going to have to be. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I totally agree with you. I I, I share the same thoughts. Oh man, brother! I mean, you got me on the, you got me fired up. You know what the scripture says: "Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst." And he truly Amen. is. And I, I'm not, I'm not with brother Paul and with other brothers. You know that have come on. Um, uh, I know that you know it's um, like brother Bradley. I'm thinking of brother Bradley. Shout out to brother Bradley. Um, I wanted yeah, to I shout mean, out this um, out. I want to shout out this one channel, Breath of Life Teaching. 
he's like a Canadian guy, but he does yes. oneness doctrine as well. And I think he's a good enough guy to subscribe to you as well. I've also I don't reached know. I don't out know to him this. That well. I just, I just I've also reached out to this gentleman. <laughs> I'm just yeah. working out for some dates. I, that's that that is my hope, brother. Is that we all, you know, we're all that we all all be assembled under the same roof of our same God, our same Lord, Master, and that we're just going. He will help us to work us through all of these um, misunderstandings or disagreements. <laughs> Uh, and that, you know, at least we can be all united in the Shema. That's the yeah. most important thing. I mean, you, we might have some differences. I, I think you can, you can feel me on this, Brother Rapport. You know, we might have some differences because we're all at different levels in our walk. Yeah. But there's one thing we need to get straight is the Shema, is the greatest commandment. Exactly. Uh, Mark 12 of 28 to 29 deuteronomy 6 4 if you don't get that right um then you're having an unfaithful spiritual relationship and it was all about marriage you know the hebrew concept of god was also uh echoing marriage you know yeah. one husband you know would, would you want like to be involved in a you know multiple partners i mean just just think of that your wife being shared the woman of you know the woman that you love is being shared with multiple partners multiple husbands it's sick it's sick and that's what the trinity doctrine teaches you know it's a it's a bride who has a relationship with multiple husbands it's not just you know the bridegroom jesus it's the bridegroom the father or they'll say oh no it's the father um, you know, um, preparing a marriage for his son. But then they forget the other passages in the Old Testament where it says that God the Father is the husband of Israel. What do you do with those passages? Do we just, like, avoid them? You can't. Yeah, I, I you think can't. you truly have to start from the Old Testament and read the whole Bible because yeah. how could you how could you um, just skip to the New Testament? That's yeah. what a lot of Christians do, including myself. When I was a Catholic, I skipped to the New Testament yeah. at first. And so I think you got to start from the Old Testament and it really just makes sense yeah. of the whole thing from the and, beginning to the end because you'll see it yes. says our Lord is one God. Um God is the word, the word is good, the word is God, Jesus is the word, and then you'll start to put put together the rest sense. of the doctrine. And Adolf Harnack, um, this theologian, he actually states that the monarchians started with the Old Testament when they were debating with the Logos Christology camp. They yep. didn't go to right off the bat, oh, well, you see, Jesus is talking to the Father here, doesn't make any sense. Uh, they started with the foundation. They started from the Old Testament. They didn't start from the new. And a lot of these Trinitarians like Tertullian, Origen, uh, all of these guys, Hypolitus, they started the debate with the New Testament. How can you start from the roof and then work your way down to the foundation? You have to start from the foundation of a house and work your way up to the top, to the roof. Makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a little bit harder to understand some of the stuff because um, some of the stories, they do seem a little um, more unrealistic than the New Testament is re like really realistic. It's New Testament. And there's nothing really mm -hmm. not realistic, but like being swallowed by, um, you know, a whale for three days whale. and being the sign of Jonah and then <laughs> Jesus showing himself as the sign of Jonah. That that's how you put it together from the Old Testament to the New Testament mm -hmm. and why the story has to be real, because Jesus is um, showing the sign of Jonah. And so that means, yes. therefore, this Jonah story has to be real. And so you can do it either way. But when it comes to the Trinity, I'd read it chronologically from the beginning to the end. When it comes to um, those other things, I would go, like, learn about Jesus, like, oh, and then learn about the sign of Jonah, then learn about Jonah. But you could do it yes. either way, like. But when it comes to the Trinity, I say start from the beginning to go to the end, because then you can realize sure. that God is one. No, no, uh, Amen, uh, brother. I, I I don't know how much how much time you have left, but I just I did wanted to share this, this quickly, and I wanted your thoughts on this, and um, maybe you might you know 
you know, give some of your thoughts on this comment. Yeah, uh, we can always do another to, stream um, too as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. I think in closing, I'll just share this and just get some of your thoughts because I'm interested to to, okay. to hear some of your thoughts on this. And I'm, I'm thinking of doing a series on this to have Brother Paul come back. Would you Would you come nice. back, Brother? But yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm honored and I'm blessed as well. So, um, yeah, it says here, um, I just wanted to read this part here. Now, these Catholics prevailing and they having not only the scriptures ordered by the Emperor Constantine to be translated into the tongue, translated mm. into Latin. OK, um, I'm not going to get too much into this question about the Aramaic and the Hebrew and how I believe that the Greek was not the original, um, the, the original manuscripts were not based from the Greek. The Greeks were based from another source, and uh, they call it the source Q, uh, but that would be for another time. But um, I'm not trying to disparage the Greek either. I'm just saying that you have to understand that a lot of these Hebrews, these Israelites, during the time of Jesus, they, they didn't speak Greek. It was only... Only the the nobles, the uh, 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 the, uh, 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 arist, uh, the the aristocrats of uh, the, the Jew the Jewish aristocrats who spoke Greek, um, and people like from Galilee, uh, people like from Jerusalem, <coughs> the people they really spoke Aramaic, and um, I think some of the priests spoke Hebrew. So uh, that that circulated, but it's it's a it's a whole nother topic. It's a very interesting topic, but it says, but likewise, the learned councils collected and gathered into a heap and all the other writings of preceding bishops, then must them books and traditional reports be viewed by the learned now made bishop and what agreed and acquiesced with the principles was counted apostolical which basically to translate this they're saying that all the books like from Sibelius Noatius who were Monarchians were confiscated were either burnt or revised or they were just kept uh, you know locked away in secret and I believe brother um, Paul a lot of these writings of the Monarchians are kept in the Vatican Library to this day, oh, yeah. I really, really believe that a lot of the writings of the Monarchians, because interestingly enough, you won't have uh, any sources, man, you know, any books left from Sibelius. And he wrote books. And, you know, how convenient they were all confiscated by the Catholics. <laughs> so um, how, how can we make a case? And yet, and yet, you know, uh, historians like Thomas Tomkinson, uh, managed to get a lot of the the arguments and the 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 teachings and the view of the monarchians based from the arguments of the adversaries. That's how we were able to to um, to understand the view of the monarchians, the modalists, because we were uh, basing all of these um, this view from their enemies, from the uh, from people like Tertullian. This is how we were able to see. Oh, this is what Sibelius believed in. This is what uh, to, um, Noatius believed in. But um, aside from that, a lot of the writings were confiscated. I think you might be right. And, uh, because I, if you look at yeah. the Athanasius Creed that came after, that was obviously Catholics who did that. And they forged that just to make sure that their doctrine was looked at. Um, was sealed. Yeah, yeah. over the yeah. Monarchians. Yeah, it makes. And he says, and what did not agree was rejected and counted heresy or else they translated them falsely. I'll just get back up. What else they uh, what what else they translated or else they translated them falsely, like one John five, seven he's, he's literally, you know, you know, giving this hint to, you know, scriptures like one John five, seven, which I, I know it's an annotation. So uh, John wrote, it's literally a monk that wrote this and it was Erasmus that translated it because it was based on this forgery, on this, um, on this uh, manuscript 
that was actually a for forged by you know this monk. I forget the name of this monk, but uh, it was a Catholic monk that forged this. And uh, and he says placing down some things of the sayings and leaving others out that made against them. How convenient! Yeah. So you know, exactly. censorship that, what, was already back in the day. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. They're just yeah. trying to keep their authority of the Catholic Church, so they'll so they'll. Uh, you know, screw with history and historical writings to just prove their doctrines instead. And and then he says, and this I'll just end with this, and then I'll I'll, I'll leave it over to you, brother Paul. He says, and when any man was by these established bishops judged or accused for heresy, though he lived before their days, you see, before their days they were the majority, the monarchians. Even if he he had the testimony saying, but this is the teachings we had since the beginning. No, they silenced them. They kick them out of the of the of the ecclesia, and then the books must either be corrupted. It says either corrupted or burnt, and must. Um, sorry about this. And for they must be made to speak quite contrary to what they did in several things on purpose to make those authors the more contemptible. You see, so they were, um, you know, painting us in a bad light. They were misrepresenting their opponents, the monarchians, the modalists. And I've seen this with Trinitarians. They always misrepresent our our teachings. They don't right. they don't it, they don't uh What about the modalists right here? Correctly. Don't they don't the modalists believe in a separate thing from the monarchists that they believe in three different modes and wear three different masks or something like that? That's not true. You see, no. that's a misrepresentation which the Trinitarians did. So they made up that well, um, definition? They, they made up. Even Hypolitus, uh, Tertullian, they would uh, misrepresent their adversary. So they're only parroting what the so modalists church were father really, said. So modalists were really monarchists, and then later Catholics said that they believed something that they didn't? Yeah, exactly. The, the, the term modalist was actually coined by Adolf Harnack. Okay. He's the one who, who coined the term modalists, which basically is not a bad term because modalist actually means form. It comes from the word form. And we know in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 1 verse 1, it says that God spoke at sundry times, uh, sundry times through diverse manners in different, through different forms, you know? Yeah. So we know God, you know, used forms like a pillar of cloud, a pillar of fire, uh, he appeared as a man in the in the plains of Mamre in Genesis 18. So the term modalist uh, is not a um, an occult term. It's just a way of labeling uh, us uh, as as their adversaries. They just want to label us with a, a specific term. But that that um, argument which you made from you know the uh, the opposite camp about you know, different modes and, you know, the father shifts and he becomes the son and then he becomes the Holy Spirit and then he becomes like the father. That's that's not what we held. The modalists, the monarchians never taught this. Never. Yeah. Um, okay. Th that This is just a misnomer and a misrepresentation. Okay, of, um, I understand that. Of these teachings. And then he goes on to say, I just want to skip this. He, he actually says... Um, uh, and the non-commissioned ministers of God and such as had uh, an anti-church are for hiding truth from the people as the papists do the scriptures. They actually confiscated during the uh, Middle Ages, the scriptures. Uh, they, they called the people profane and only the priests could read the Bible. So he's actually he's, he really knows his history. Uh, to wow. the end, they may keep up the fleshly honor so that there is but little known and received into the world at this day, this very day, as well as heretofore, but the universal common opinion. That's what Catholic means. Universal. One, one world religion. One world, a new world order. Uh, that's universalism. And we know that, you know, the, the synagogue of Satan um, they are using this universalism to unite the world under the Messiah. 
Um, so therefore it is that your national and traditional churches doth so found forth their own triumphs, their own triumphs, raise heaps of authors of the first centuries, the church fathers, as agreeing with the Catholic principles. You see, it's all biased. There is no impartiality here. They've, they've controlled, they've, they've censored history, and they're saying, no, no, you know, all of the, the monarchians, the works, it's all confiscated. We are running the house now. Crying antiquity, church visibility, famous men are on our side. They always say wow. this in debates. Oh, yeah, scholarship is on our side. You're dumb. You're stupid. We have, <laughs> you, you know, and this is exactly what Thomas Tomkinson was saying back in the 1600s. This wow. is, was published in 1695, brother. So um, he says, He's when as on. the truth on it, and I'll finish with this, when, the, when, when as the truth, all is but clamor and noise. All is but clamor and noise. For many of your authors are mere forgeries of lies. That is mm. so deep. He's just saying all of this is a big deception. All of this is a big deception. They've stolen our heritage, our Christian heritage, brothers and sisters. But yeah. we've found it again in, in the, the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I will lead you in all truth. I will not leave you comfortless in uh, John 16. He says, you know, I will come to you. I will not leave you uh, comfortless. In 14, my bad, it's in John 14. And 16, he also um, echoes this. But, you know... Brother, do you want to make a quick comment on this? Uh, well, I, I know it was very lengthy, but it was so important for me to share this because well, I, you know, I history know. has been revised. I, I didn't, I didn't realize the Catholic Church stole their documents. That's the only part that <laughs> that you're telling me that's brand new, and so it per makes perfect sense why it would be in the Vatican Library. And uh, last week, if you look at the news, they just allowed the Jews to look at the Vatican Library. And so no. I, I wouldn't be, I would be very interested to know if it's about the same topics. Oh man. No, you're serious. <laughs> yeah. What, what last week? Yep. It was something like a week or a two, two weeks ago or less than a week ago. It was a either on the tour. It was either on the Rome reports Catholic channel or it was on something I seen on Twitter with the news article. Have you heard about the Monarchan prologues? No. Yeah, look, check it out, brother. We might do a separate uh, episode on this. The Monarchian Prologues, it was commentaries uh, on the first book of John, chapter one. You know, like the Trinitarians, they always put the commentaries in our Bibles. Yeah. Well, yeah. back in, in the third century, they had the Monarchians, who were the majority, as you know, and they would put the commentary, you know, like shedding some light on some hard terms and saying this yeah. is what it means the sun you know don't don't be confused from a monarchian perspective do they still the have monarchian that around? prologues no they've confiscated it uh, and it and it's all of these manuscripts are like hundreds of thousands of of dollars and it belongs like to private collectors but um i'm sure i'm sure if uh you know with a bit of leading of the holy spirit you know and and some, you know, contacts, you know, maybe someone might, you know, get one of these, these manuscripts and actually translate it. It's in Latin. And uh, it was actually commentaries from a monarchian perspective, not Trinitarian. And a lot of, um, there were some uh, 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 historians that were making the case saying, you see, it also proves yet again, the words of Tertullian when he says the majority were monarchians because you have documents such as these the monarchian prologues that are showing they didn't know of a trinity they were always talking about one ruler so um yeah there you well, have it yeah if you think about it think about monarchy too like is is it the same word as king is there or synonymous yes, with the word this is where we get yeah. our word from monarchy monarch yeah yeah because if, if you think about the kingdom who was the king of the kingdom and then who was Jesus's king. And so it obviously would Amen. make sense to be 
Amen. to be a monarch monarchism is it isn't god the father called king isn't yeah Jesus i think he's the king he's, of kings in revelation 19 yeah king of kings and and he controls the kingdom and so and then yes. and so yeah it's uh, jesus is king and yeah. so jesus is god <laughs> jesus is king and so king of the it jews just makes sense to me perfectly <laughs> yep king of the jews and, and and a lot of, you know, I just love it when the Trinitarians are saying, oh, well, it's it's not really important, you know, uh, who's a king. You know, they always go, they always deal with the question of rulership from a human perspective. Um, in the Old Testament, in the book of Samuel, you know, who was the first king of Israel? It wasn't Sam, it wasn't Saul, it who? wasn't David, it was Yahweh. God, the, the father was literally called the 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 king of israel and god literally says to the people of israel because you've refused me as king okay i have given you a human ruler you know according to the flesh so you know it's just it's so important to understand that yeah god uh, god elects kings because yeah, he is kingship the king. originally belonged to god and that's yeah. why he became man it was to reclaim that from fallen man. He said, you know, you want a king, a fallen human king? Try that for a few um, centuries. See how that works. It ended in disaster. And, uh, you know, obviously, you know, uh, Israel. And remember, they tried, um, to make, they tried to make Jesus his king. They wanted, Je they wanted Jesus to rule as king on this earth. And yes. he was like, no, I'm the uh, king of the kingdom in heaven. Yeah. Right. My kingdom is not uh, and from, so this, uh, from this world. They wanted him to be an actual king, but he elects kings. He's not He's not a ruler, right? Yeah. He, yeah, he is. And he will be a ruler in the Sorry, millennium. Sorry, I got bad service right now. In, in the millennium, he will be a ruler uh, because ruler ultimately means yeah. someone that presides over the human affairs. So, you know, we know we can't count on our, our, our pol politicians. We can't, yeah. you know, we can't, you know, um, we can't uh, depend our salvation on human kings, mortal kings. Uh, we've, we've had that for centuries. Never worked. So obviously, you know, God is going to have to show us in the millennium how that, that, that looks like. And uh, we know he will rule with an iron, a rod of iron. And um, that just is beautiful. You know, I mean, for all of these politicians that you think, you know, is representing your ideals, your hopes for mankind or your nation, they're all hypocrites. They've all been bought by Satan. Yeah. The only one that is going to rule and reign is Jesus Christ, God Almighty, the everlasting father. Um, exactly. You know, God allowed mankind to, you know, kind of control his own destiny and it didn't work. So we all got daddy issues, my friends. <laughs> we all got daddy <laughs> issues and the real Abba, the real daddy is the one that resides in heaven. He's going to come down. The scripture says he's going to give us a yeah. hug. He's going to wipe all tears. I mean... Can, can you imagine that, Brother Paul? I, I've never met you in the flesh, but can you just imagine that? Someone is like fulfilling all of your desires and has known you since birth. And he's like, I'm your real father. I know, I know how you feel. I know what it's like to be bruised. I know what it's like to be beaten. I know what it's like to be trodden down in the mire. I know what it's like. I've suffered then more than any man. I can relate to you. That's that's what that's what we want to be like children again, right? We want to be kids again. Yeah. That's they said our like, innocence that's why was the, uh, the child the child like receives the gifts, right? Like the people who are childlike. I can't think of mm -hmm. the exact verse. Amen. You Amen. know what verse I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I totally um, the. Um, the, the kingdom of God um, is likened. Um, you, if you do not have a mind of a child, you will no wise enter the kingdom yeah. of God. 
the kingdom of heaven if you do not have a mind of a child yeah that's the one Yeah, this uh, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes lowly position of this child is the greatest in kingdom he- in the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Whoever um, welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So it's basically like all these scholars that think they're like, oh, I'm an adult yes. scholar and all this stuff. They forgot how to be childlike, and that's why people like me and you are blessed with the wisdom, and they are embarrassed and humbled uh, and, and don't get the wisdom you read my mind i was going to say the yeah. same thing i was saying god chose you brother paul he chose us because we're just like kids you know yeah. even if satan like has poked us in our hearts and all we're still standing yeah. we're still standing by the blood of jesus christ we're Amen. still standing man this was so edifying thank you for Brother Paul, Thank you, man. I, know I, I got it. so much opposition this week. I got so much opposition in last week. I understand now. Yeah. Why? <laughs> it's so, when you speak yeah, truth, you'll you always get opposition. On. Yeah, oh, I appreciate you for having me on because there's a lot of people out here not telling the truth and they're using God's name and they're making money off God's name and they're lying to the youth. And they're not hit, taking care of the widows or the orphans, and so Amen. that's up. That's up to God. It's not up to me. I'm just here to tell the truth. So that's. I hope we do another live stream <clears throat> sometime soon. Hope I got more to contribute, and we can do this again. Oh, Amen. Sure, you do. Well, um, brothers and sisters, thank you again for coming on, and um, I'm just going to make a prayer, brother Paul. Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, God Almighty, our everlasting Abba, our everlasting Father, our Savior, our friend. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this moment with my brother Paul, with our brothers and sisters. Uh, Though we are absent in the body, we will be present in your body. And we know where two or three are gathered in your name. And, you know, your name is, is spirit. And um, we are, we're going to see you as a glorified uh, man. You will come down from on high and you will set your kingdom up. And we can trust in that kingdom. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for helping us through this live discussion. I thank you that you are, um, um, you are waking uh, your your assembly you're waking up your sons and your daughters to the lies to the deception and it's so encouraging lord because like brother paul said we're just hearing so many lies hypocrisy uh, double standards people that are coming in your name they're profiting from your name and we're just we're just fed up we're sick and tired of it because we're jealous for your namesake like elijah we're jealous for your name's sake because we take seriously. We were broken individuals. We're, our lives were a mess. We're living a life of sin headed to hell. And you came and you and you saved us and you had mercy on us. And, and now we can be called sons of God. So I, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for my dear brother Paul. And and I'm so humbled, Heavenly Father. And, and please stay with us, Lord, like like David said. Don't leave me. Do not leave us. And you said you will not leave us. You will not leave us comfortless. So we thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Paul. Well, thank I'll, you. I'll, we'll stay in touch. Okay. All right, brother. Take it easy.